One of the best known identities in regen agriculture in Australia is of course Charles Massey who wrote the seminal book Call of the Reed Warbler. Charles has spent his lifetime not only looking into the practices of regenerative agriculture and what makes people swap to this way of dealing with the land, but also practicing it himself on his family property. Today, I've got the pleasure of being out with Charles in the paddock. Charles, how are you, mate? I'm good, thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to come out here and talk to you not only about what your journey has been in Regen, but where you think the future of Regen is going and if anything indeed has changed. Okay, sounds interesting. You've picked a typical Monero day. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice and cold, nice and overcast. That's right. <laughs> Let's get started, mate. Okay. Now, Charles, there are spectacular things happening on your property, but sometimes it's the smaller things that are even more meaningful to you, aren't they? Yeah, well, uh, the obvious one is the regeneration of what's really the best C4 native grass you want, which is Themata australis kangaroo grass. Yes. But it's no good just having a... Which is a, this stuff here. It, yeah, this beautiful... And you can see why it got eaten out so widely across eastern Australia it's so palatable and it's green throughout the summer and all that sort of stuff. And when the early explorers <coughs> arrived in Australia and they were riding across the plains they saw this as wheat they thought that there was just acres and acres of wheat. That's right it? and it was up to the top of the saddle must have been magnificent yeah. and the ground was spongy um, rather with, than with, with poor rock grazing hard. practices that disappeared from Absolutely. the landscape. Yeah. This yeah. is a major victory for you getting this back, isn't it? This is an well, it's, a, it's an exciting indicator. It's not universal across, but once we get our uh, rotational regen grazing right, we're starting to get this shift back to what the original landscape was. So there's a couple of indicators underneath the kangaroo grass that are really exciting as well, aren't there? Well, it is. You're, you're hoping that um, you're not just getting a main dominant grass, but that the, the, the full ecosystem starting to come back with it. And so things like these little forbs, which are very palatable, um, little native daisies and um, other sort of grasses, um, and what people would call weeds, but they're actually, you know, hole-punching, deep-rooted. And they're part of a colony of plants that are actually getting minerals and nutrients out of the soil Absolutely. without having to add yeah. fertiliser. Yeah, so it's, to start seeing the, the number one ants pants, carbon-4, native grass, Thermida australis, kangaroo grass coming back, you can see it's, it's just shed all its seeds, which means it's going to wash downhill a bit if we get a decent rain. And... Um, now that's is, that's an exciting a in itself. It's a nutritious grazing plant. Very. It's endemic and suited to the Australian landscape that does well in these soils. Yeah, and from. survives this climate well. Absolutely. From the Queensland border all the way down through to the Victorian border and into South Australia, this was the dominant grass. You read the early explorers, the red headed seeds were, were waving up with the saddle. Yeah. But in an area like this, which was stocked from about the 1820s, um, and no fences, of course, until about the 1880s and 90s. Sheep just set stock and they just killed this out very, very quickly because it's so palatable. So to, to start getting it back is, to us is pretty exciting because with the diversity of your, your perennial grasses and your forbs, and you start to get um, the insects and, and all the other functional operators coming with, with them to start aerating the soil and bringing up nutrients and all that sort of thing. So it's, it's um, sort of counterproductive to <clears throat> more of an industrial view where you put in a monoculture and plough the shit out of things and kill off this diversity, which the animals prefer. They, they can self-medicate if they find plants and uh, they're sick of the, of the rich ice cream, they'll go for something else to help the room. And you know, so it's working um, with the whole ecosystem and your animals. So you're increasing your carbon to nitrogen ratio by having other plants like these forbs, which is in improving room and health, lowering the pH of the animal and increasing their health. Spot on, absolutely. Let's go and have a look at some other good indicators that things might be going well after okay. a few decades of regen. Um, yeah, well, I'm not saying it's all working perfectly, but uh, this is sort of an exciting indicator that something's happening. What's that bird, Charles? That's uh, what we call a skylark, and um, they're, they're the fellas out here in the open country. 
Beautiful, cool. And beautiful, and that's that's him letting everyone else know that this is his territory. And you've and, seen uh, an explosion in birds as well, as a, uh, like that? Yes, I mean, this year, for example, there's uh, a heap of quail and um, lots of um, skylarks, pivots is their other, other name. Um, and out in our bush country, oh, I couldn't tell, tell you how many trees we've planted, um, 60, 70,000 in, in trying to bring functionality back in tree breaks across the overcleared landscape. Talking to some of the expert bird people from Birding Australia, Greening Australia, we've got a, a really wonderful person from Bird, uh, Greening Australia that helps us, Nikki Tours in Canberra. With the increasing clearing in the northern New South Wales, the, it, it's the your insectivorous sort of passerine type birds that are being wiped out. We're starting to see species like hooded robins, scarlet robins and stuff that we're seeing them in much bigger numbers than we've had before. So we, the, the, the um, three or four hundred acres of bush we've got here and all our tree breaks are now playing a really important refugia role for endangered insectivorous bird species. And um, you know we find that pretty exciting. Yeah. They're also providing a service for you, aren't they? Because you're not getting all of the insect pests that other neighbouring properties may have to deal with with chemicals. My father came here at the, just at the start of the Great Depression and um, he said every six, seven years they'd be wiped out with wingless grasshoppers and because the country had been over cleared by then. We started more ecological grazing in the early end of the 80s, early 90s. And since about uh, 1991, we haven't had a wingless grasshopper wipeout. Because A, we've got the ground cover up, because grasshoppers like bare ground for their mm -hmm. egg beds. But as our tree breaks have evolved and diversified and kept our ground cover, um, you've got all the pest species have come in to control the wingless grasshopper. So we, we haven't had a wipeout in that time at all. Uh, but, but it used to be so bad, my father said, that the grasshoppers would eat the green paint off the veranda and eat the green pattern on the tablecloth on the line and that sort of stuff. They're programmed for green. Yeah, yeah. But once you get ecological control working, um, and, and look, I couldn't, I know it still happens locally in, a, in bad grasshopper years, the set stocking approach. I, I couldn't put an economic value on having kept our ground cover. And, and, um, and pest control of the wingless grasshoppers. It's enormous. Now, no one's perfect, Charles. Everyone has learning experiences. A lot of them. You've brought me to show <laughs> you one of yours. Yep. This is one of your early tree breaks from the early 80s. Yeah. And you used exotics. Yep. Uh, and you're not, you're not opposed to using exotics. You're using oak trees and various other things yeah. on your farm yep. appropriately. Yeah. But the problem with this tree break, you reckon it was too narrow? Yes, uh, you can see it, it from here. It looks terrific, um, yeah. wind penetrability and all that. But from an ecological point of view, and, and the, for your small birds and hopefully mammals, there's too much edge effect. There's no depth for them to hide from predators. So you have your your little falcons and small birds of yeah. prey and things like yeah. that. Yeah, picking them off. Yeah, particularly not so much your kestrels, but your your, your smaller falcons that will sweep up and pick anything coming out and so... So you've used some eucalypts now to build this break out. Yeah, correct. As you can see up there, the extra plantings, that was, you wouldn't call it wasteland, but it's, I've only lost probably an acre or two in what's really probably about a six acre planting, just to fill that up and, and if you like bulk out um, more um, biodiversity and shrubs for, for little birds to, to feel a lot safer. So that they might come down and feed, but they, they've got a refugia to escape to. And you'll still graze this and use it as a lambing paddock or something like that? Well, you can see the trough there and, and, and country between us, but in time, um, the fence around that, and, and, and they're very simple fences, which we're gonna discuss in a minute, um, that will come away and it'll become part of the paddock. So the story of water on this property is a really important one as well. The management of water with reworking your grazing systems was critical, wasn't it, Charles? Absolutely. So, Charles, you've used these water cells to divide up your paddocks. You put the water structure in first and then you've fenced off to them and you've even brought tree breaks in. Can you take us through how you've set this water cell up 
and some of the tips that you've learned from years of doing this? Yep, well, usually you learn the hard way. Uh, initially, <coughs> we had what we call self centers a bit too small. So, and then you can have them too big because we, you don't want stock camping in them. You want them to come in, water, get out. And you, and, and you need a capacity where enough can come in, but it's not too big where they do that camping. So after trial and error for, for sheep, this, this is a five paddock watering system, so. It's quite a small area, isn't it? It is, but you know, for mobs of a thousand, they self-regulate very easily. They're not all gonna come in at the same time. I mean, you do see it sometimes out on Western tanks later in an evening, everything streams in and out, but in this climate, they, um, they come in the morning and then probably come in, depending on the day. Mm. Uh, so we find that after trial and error, that's, they self-regulate pretty nicely. There's enough space, a little bit of socialisation going on, etc. Just for a bit of context, these are sheep. What size are your average mobs of your sheep that are um, using this cell? 800 to 1,000 sometimes, yeah. yeah. So it's, yeah. It's, it's really uncomfortable for them to stay. Yeah, and we didn't but put... But it's not uncomfortable for them to come and get a drink. No. Is that nice idea? Yeah, balance? that's right. So we didn't put shade around deliberately. Mm -hmm. uh, shade's back out in the paddock. So you want them to come in, get their drink, and either go back grazing or camp. Okay. Um, Whereas if you were to put shade over the water trough, that might encourage them to... They would hang stay. around too much, and then you've got litter issues coming down and all that sort of stuff. So um, for cattle, um, you obviously need a bit bigger than this. Um, uh, because you don't want them knocking around infrastructure if they if it's a really hot day and they start you know argy barging sort of thing. So it's it's horses for courses I think. Uh, but you can see it it sort of certainly suits the job uh, pretty well for this. Uh, and it's, and there's five paddocks coming in here. <coughs> you don't want <coughs> putting one trough in each paddock. You just it's un. It, it's, it's a silly way of using infrastructure when one can do. Troughs are very expensive things and there are a lot of maintenance as well. Exactly right. Yeah, so yeah. one trough to five paddocks. What I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the camera off the tripod now and I'll just get you to take us for a little walk around this cell and just point out all the, spe all the features and where the fences are going. Right, okay. So what we're looking at here is pretty simple approach to a cell centre. It's not rocket science. Uh, you need gateways, if you've got big mobs, and we can have up to a thousand watering on it, you want plenty of width so there's no argy-bargy and, uh, and damage to, to animals. Uh, and it's just a matter then of where, with the five paddocks, where you site, site your fences, etc., etc. And the other thing that we'll look at uh, is that, in addition to this sort of a cell centre, is um, with our regular grazing, where mobs are usually only in a paddock for two days, we, we only have seven wire fences, very simple fence structure with cheap lightning droppers in between uh, a steel post every up to 30 metres. And, and um, the fences sort of quaver a bit if they push at it and, and that puts them off, but they usually don't work the fences because they're being moved so regularly. So the fencing costs become a lot cheaper, just five, no, seven wires rather, uh, and a few um, cheap lightning droppers and um, a simple design for your water centre. Uh, and you can see where a tree break comes in here, um, more for aesthetics, I think, than uh, what we were careful was not to put shade trees around the water. You don't want the animals camping where they should be watering because the shade's out in the paddock. So just a few tricks like that that you learn the hard way. Unfortunately, at this point, Charles and I were interrupted and I wasn't able to conclude the interview. But I really want to thank him for the opportunity to walk around his farm and I hope that you got as much out of this as I did. It's a rare opportunity to spend time with someone who's been so passionate, intelligent and active in the rural space for as long as Charles. As always, if you like this kind of content, please don't forget to subscribe.